Hello, and welcome to another episode of PPC Town Hall. My name is Fred Valles. I'm your host. I'm also the CEO and co-founder at Optimizer. So we got to talk about the thing that nobody can stop talking about in PPC, which is Performance Max. And the thing with Performance Max is it's really drastically changing all the best practices that we've been building for the past 20 years of doing PPC. People are trying to figure out what are these new best practices. And so in an effort to get some of these new best practices, we said we got to talk to the experts who are actually running these campaigns, who've done some really exciting experiments. So we got two guests. We got Mike and Corey joining us to tell us what they've done. We're going to look at scripts. We're going to look at audiences. We're going to look at campaign structure and try to get very hands on. And we'll leave you at the end with a checklist for how to go through your PMAX campaigns and make sure they're performing. So welcome to another episode of PPC Town Hall. All right, and here are my guests for today, Mike Rhodes and Corey Lindholm. Welcome, guys. Hey, Fred. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Fred. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having us here. Yeah, it's uh, Mike, it's been a few years since I've been to Australia, and we've been uh, able to meet in person. Hopefully, that'll happen again. Hopefully, again. Wait, I seem to remember a lot of glasses on the table that night. Hi. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Strangely, I don't remember that. Maybe it's to do with it. So, uh, Mike, tell us uh, who you are, what you do. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Web Savvy. So we're a done-for-you agency here in Australia, but we look after brands all over the world. Uh, I also teach a bunch of agencies over at agencysavvy.com, which sort of fell out the back of uh, writing the book with Perry Marshall, The Ultimate Guide to Google Ads. We're on our sixth edition of that. Uh, we're told it's the best-selling book on Google Ads in the world, which is kind of crazy. Um, probably do another edition, given the uh, the pace things are changing. Um, and yeah, I've been doing Google Ads for 18 years, which makes me a dinosaur. So I'm here to learn from Corey, who's all over it and on top of things. And uh, I'm going to ask as many questions as I answer, I think. Yeah, there we go. Let's call you a legend instead of a dinosaur. <laughs> um, well, yeah, definitely. Mike's, Mike's a legend in my book. I actually read The Ultimate Guide to Google Ads six, seven years ago, so... <laughs> I'm with him. Yeah. Okay, Corey. So yeah, you're the the young blood in this conversation. <laughs> tell, uh, tell folks a little bit who you are and uh, where you're hanging out these days. Yeah, definitely. So I'm mostly hanging out on LinkedIn, a little bit on Twitter. I'm a paid paid search freelancer, uh, mostly specializing in Google and Microsoft ads. So paid search. Um, nearly a decade now, I'd say, um, particularly in the e-com space. Um, I do a lot of account management, a very, very select group of larger clients. Um, I also am sort of the ghost advertiser for a lot of some of the best agencies out there that shall go unnamed, but I'm, I may be that guy that's actually delivering amazing results for you, so don't tell anybody. I'm also doing a lot of consulting and training services, um, not only for premier partner agencies across the globe, but um, training and consulting for business owners, um, in in-house marketing teams, individual marketers that are just coming up in the field. So a very vast experience. And uh, yeah, it's uh, people come to me, I think, a lot of the times because they, they want to get right, they want to cut right through it and just no BS. What's the good information? What's the real stuff? You know, a lot of people, they don't necessarily want management. They just want the insights as if someone was managing their account at a professional level. And that's a lot of what I provide. Right. And you go way beyond the theory. You got the hands-on experience. So exactly. say what you think is going to happen and then see how it actually works. And so that's how we get these best practices. Yep. Um, so Corey, you're a first timer on the show. Really great to have you here. For the listeners and the viewers today, we're going to talk about Performance Max. There's sort of two angles on Performance Max. I want to be very clear. We're going to spend most of our time talking about Performance Max or e-commerce for people who sell products online. Uh, that said, we all have a little bit of experience with Performance Max for lead gen. So we'll start with that for a couple of minutes and then we'll cut off that topic. Um, people who don't do e-commerce, stick around if you want. But if you got other things to do, we understand because then we're going to go dive deep into e-com. Uh, but as far as PMAX for the lead gen, is that something you have dabbled in? And, and what are some thoughts on that? 
Yeah, um, right. Mike, I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Um, okay. So on, on the lead gen side, um, again, most of my specialty is definitely in the e-com space, but I have made uh, Performance Max quote unquote work and perform very well uh, for some lead gen clients out there, uh, particularly the finance space for whatever reason. Um, from what I can tell, um, a big part of making that successful um, for a lot of these brands is going to be um, how well you're qualifying, what counts as a conversion. Also making sure you're feeding back any kind of offline CRM conversion data back into the algorithm to make it continue to thrive and scale um, long-term. Um, and the reason I say it's so important to qualify um, that traffic from Performance Max is some may know the ones that are a little bit, have been around in the industry a little bit longer is that display, the Google Ads display network um, there's a lot of spam on there, unfortunately. There's a lot of great traffic as well, um, definitely. But um, in order to help um, negate some of those maybe click farms or spam type traffic, uh, just putting a caption on the site may not actually do a great deal of help. Really, what I'm seeing is if you have a large, difficult form, it sounds totally um, counterintuitive to the CRO experts out there, the conversion rate optimization specialists and best practices, but having a lot of difficult forms to fill out, maybe it's like a, a solver puzzle um, that takes a little bit of time for someone to go through, that can really help alleviate um, having to accidentally feed back into the algorithm, Google's algorithm, um, to go find more people that are spam or that are click farms. So if you think it's just going to be a matter of targeting the right country, know that there's VPNs out there. These click farms like to use those. So targeting a location isn't going to necessarily fix that issue. So just to wrap that up, it's really make your forms very difficult to fill out. If you're going to run performance max for a lead gen company, um, whether that's like for me, the finance thing works really well because they have to do a full on credit check just to finish <laughs> getting the conversion fired. Um, so that's just really important. And then making sure you're integrating your CRM, your offline conversion data and feeding that bit back into the algorithm. So you have um, that as a competitive uh, lever in your account, but also just, again, to make these algorithms a little bit smarter for you. Yeah, totally agree. With Pmax, it's so automated. You have to give it the best information possible to make those decisions for you. Um, and so that either means integrating with a CRM system or making it really hard for a bot to fill out that form. Um, now, and Corey, I'll stay with you for just one more minute here, but you said, you said you've made it work. Do you yes. love the challenge of making it work or do you just flat out prefer to stay with the uh, traditional search and display campaigns and maybe throw in a a discovery campaign on top of it. Yeah, I, uh, more of the latter. Yeah, I, I like to use it as a nice test to see um, if we can use a more full funnel approach outside of what we're already accomplishing and doing well in the rest of the account. But preferably, I'd like to see what success we can get with very targeted campaigns, whether that's video discovery, et cetera, to your point, display, plus search and then test performance max on a light amount of budget. Um, I'd rather go that approach um, than you know putting the majority of the available ad spend budget towards performance max and kind of hoping for the best. That's not, uh, not generally the strategy that most of my <laughs> clients are gonna wanna be happy to go after, though some are exceptions and they do just wanna give it a shot. I do, I will say that if you are one of those businesses that are willing to give it a shot in these sort of early days, you have a large competitive advantage from a CPC standpoint because a lot of these lead gen businesses are hesitant to try Pmax. So you may have an edge up on the competition if you can make it work um, by getting in there early. Right. And if you're going to pay a smart PPC manager, then why use the fully automated thing, right? So that's kind of the argument. If you're going to fully automate it, just do some of the basics, right? And maybe don't invest in an agency. If you're going to invest in an agency, know that they come with additional smarts that allow you to do things better in those old school campaigns. Mike, uh, what are your thoughts on Pmax for a lead gen? I think Corey's pretty much nailed it, mate. Um, not a lot to add. I think, yeah, that the risk tolerance of the client, of the person running the account, of the person paying the bill is a, is a really important point. Um, most businesses have spent a lot of time thinking about conversion rates, optimizing the hell out of their sites. And so to sort of build a new page off to the side to make it difficult on purpose to add all of that friction um, and to really make sure that the quality of that data is good. There's not many, certainly not as many of the, of the businesses that we talk to that are willing to sort of go through all that when 
things are working really well without Pmax. So for me, until we have to use Pmax for lead gen, find a test it. If the risk tolerance is there, if they're going to do the work, if that data is high quality. But for most, for, for, I think for the average business, it's uh, you're almost better off staying where you are. If you're already doing YouTube and discovery really well and getting good results from that, I find that helps Pmax along. But that's almost another reason to kind of stay where you are. Because if that's already working really well, and you've got that dialed in, do you really want to risk it? But yeah, I've, I just was just um, auditing an account yesterday and their CPC, CPA was fantastic relative to their old campaigns, which was bizarre because the guy had no conversion value in there at all. And I don't quite know what the machine was optimizing for. Um, bit of a setup problem. But the quality of the leads seemed to be there. I think he had a difficult site um, just by accident. And, and it was working well. And the numbers were really good for him. So it can work well. But I think on, on balance, we're sticking for the vast majority of our clients to we don't need to do it yet. So we won't unless you really, really want to push the envelope and explore and experiment. Right. And I think there's no question that it can look like it performs well because it just sort of takes in everything, including remarketing. And it's sort of the same uh, problem that advertisers had in the past with smart shopping campaigns that combine all the data and don't tell you the details. And sure, a remarketing audience is going to perform at a great CPA, is going to have a great return on ad spend. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's finding you qualified new traffic, right? And so there's some tricks you need to deploy to steer it towards those new customers as opposed to uh, old ones. And it's very reactive as we'll see with some of the other stuff we're going to chat about today but i'm finding that pmax campaigns are sort of like oh and it just squirrel and it runs after that little signal really quickly um and sort of throws everything at it and if that is a fraudulent signal because you haven't done all of the work to sort of stop that getting through it can spend a lot of money very quickly on you know crappy traffic so be careful hmm. buy beware yeah. all right <laughs> Good. So um, some of the rest that we'll talk about, e-commerce and Pmax, I think some of the things might be relevant to an audience that's more lead gen focused, but let's shift to the topic that both of you, um, I, I don't want to say are stronger in because you're both strong in lead gen. It's just that you don't use Pmax as much for lead gen. And the reason, of course, that most advertisers want to talk about Pmax for e-commerce is that it has fully replaced smart shopping campaigns. Um, and so if you still want to run a smart shopping campaign, then you have to use Pmax. That's the replacement for it. And then it comes with all this other baggage of also showing your ads on discovery, on video, on display. Um, so let's shift into that. And let's talk about the ideal campaign structure when you have e-commerce campaigns. Um, so let's start with the, the simple one. Do you put your stuff in one campaign or multiple campaigns? And do you mind if I, I go through, this is a sort of exercise I go through with a lot of my consulting clients, and I think it would be really helpful before we get in the weeds of like one versus multiple, just talking about the strategic sort of pillars or maybe like dials in order to decide which of these makes sense for you. Would that be cool if we went down that quick Absolutely. rabbit hole? Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. So I say pillars or dials, um, dials in the sense that there are certain aspects that we have to consider before we make a lot of decisions on how we're going to structure, what products we're going to target, what bid strategies we're going to choose. So it's going to sound like a long list, but it's it's very, very relevant. And I do this every single day with clients. So it's going to come very quickly, but available budget, margins and profitability, uh, in particular, the percentage of your revenue that you're wanting to allocate to PPC uh, on top of your actual percentage of revenue as a margin, right? So we need to consider both of those, assign your margins of profitability and structure accordingly, get into some of the more details later. Um, sales volume, inventory, if you have any inventory clearing goals, um, other internal goals or focuses, there's a lot of things out there, improve the quality over quantity of customers for some businesses. That's going to help determine structure and what products we want to go after. Um, expanding into new marketplaces, um, dominating 
um, digital placement inventories for just particular products in a, in a marketplace. Um, sell that maybe some, you want to sell your company soon and you want to, you know, set things up accordingly for that. Those are all very big pillars and dials that need to be considered. Uh, we've talked about aversion to risk for experimentation in the account. Your affinity to patience, I think, is really important. Um, Pmax is, it's a large campaign. Let's just say it's six to seven campaign types rolled up into one. Um, you're going to have to be a little bit more patient than maybe you're used to with Google Ads, especially those do-it-yourself kind of business owners that are looking at their accounts every day. Um, Pmax will challenge your ability to be patient and give the data some time so that you can make um, some good decisions with the data that you're getting in. Um, how quickly, uh, as far as a proof of concept is needed in the results, uh, your pricing and promotional models, whether it's subscriptions, no LTV, repeat purchase rate is high. You have predominantly lost leaders that make up your, your sales. Um, those are all going to determine specific strategies, marketplace economies or economics, I should say, the quality of your website, conversion tracking, quality of your product feed, your inventory fulfillment, product availability, buying behavior, reporting capabilities, et cetera. So I just want to show at least to start, there's a lot of little things that are going to say, okay, we're going to try in today's call to go over some of the general best practices, but there are a lot of things to be considered in these decisions of whether you want a single campaign, multiple asset uh, asset groups, et cetera. So I just want to cover that really quick so that people so, don't take it at face value and say, right. oh, I, I should only do this. Yeah. Uh, so the answer is it's really simple. Um, <laughs> no, but the, the one thing that I took away from this, I mean, I took a lot away from this, but yeah. sort of Google will tell you one campaign, keep it simple. Don't worry. We'll figure it out. What I'm hearing from you is, well, you've got a business to run. And when you run that business, you have sort of an overarching goal, but then you have different strategies to achieve that goal. And yeah. those strategies will equate to different campaign structures, asset group structures. So your business is usually not that simple and straightforward. Likewise, your campaign structure probably is also not that simple and straightforward. It's going to kind of mimic how you run your business. Correct. Right? Based on all the dials and pillars that you talked about. Yes. So rather than us saying, well, it depends a hundred times and annoying the entire audience, I'll just cover all of that and then we can move forward. <laughs> okay. uh, Mike, what's sort of your high level on uh, how you approach the whole structure problem for Pmax? What you want me to add to that amazing list? Um, Here's the one thing Corey forgot. <laughs> yeah. Do you have well, whether you have dogs or cats, money, money or patience? You yeah. know, growth or profit? I think that's a, that's a really big one. What are, your, what are your business goals? Starting there and coming down from the business. What other marketing you're doing um, that's going to help this? And then drilling down into digital marketing, and then drilling down into okay, now on Google, what are your goals? Um, what evidence do we have? What previous data do we have? What sophistication level? of the client, uh, what's spread of products. So most of your products are around about the same sort of price level and, and AOV, or if there are really widespread there and different amounts of margin across your various products. Um, now let's maybe give people a simple answer. Would you ever recommend a single campaign for Pmax? Yeah, I, I, I would yeah. for a, for a smaller business that's um, wanting to, to get off the ground, wanting to run the things themselves, you've just got to you've got to know if you're doing that that you're putting a lot of trust in the machine, and if you're really leaning into that, know that it, it's not always going to work well. But if you minimise the risk, mm -hmm. lower budget, you've got some evidence that things could work. I was going to say should work, could work, should work. You know, but if you if you have no idea what your product feed, if it's good or bad, if you've never run any kind of Google shopping in the past, then I would, it's difficult. If you're trying to do it yourself, I would want to sort of start with legacy shopping, get a bit more control, get a bit more data, have the ability to have insight. You know, Andrew Locke, I think, had one of the most profound uh, sentences that anybody on this show has said. It's not the control that we miss, it's the insight. It's being able to get insight from the data and that's why we miss having data. It's not because, well, we are all control freaks, mm. but it's not the the fiddling around that we miss. It's it's being able to understand what's actually happening. It's, it's tricky, but if it's a small business, they're just trying to get some extra sales in the door, then, then yes, um, start with that, keep business. things simple. The small right. business with a simple product line or a simple kind of one service type thing for one location. Yeah, a few SKUs. Yeah, exactly. 
not tens of thousands. What, what yeah, you from, do, from a starting point, um, I like to say, you know, cons keep it consolidated to start with the expectation that you you might expand from that, right? And and that'll help um, people that are just getting started with it, but also even the more advanced advertisers. Uh, I think Mike Ryan was talking about that with you, Fred, the last time he was on is, you know, you want to start more consolidated, get the insights that you have available, get that data to then later make some segmentation decisions. Um, I like that approach as well. When you start hyper consolidated, hyper segmented, it, the risk is, is higher. Um, you may see the same search terms competing across multiple campaigns, for example, for different products. How do you deal with that? Then you have to be more reactive. Whereas if it was consolidated, you can make those decisions on segmentation around what the data provides. So I like to say start consolidated, then start creating complex, add complexity as you get data to make good decisions with. But if you don't need things to be separated because of different product feeds by country is a big example or language targeting, any kind of campaign setting, like you don't need different budgets for different products. Um, you don't need different at least to start different bid strategies for different products, customer acquisition tools, et cetera, um, then keep it consolidated, keep it simple, and then add complexity as, as you get some data in. So Mike, I, I'm going to go to you, but I want to show viewers a really good example of that. And I think that's what you brought to the session today is how do you start high level and then segment? Um, so you've done this with audiences, right? So yeah, um, starting a campaign, um, We've tried a few different things, starting with just one asset group and putting all of your audiences in there, starting with loads of asset groups. Um, we've sort of come on balance to a, a nice happy Goldilocks middle point, which is starting with a few asset groups. So typically that will be custom match and remarketing. Often we'll lump those together because they're kind of similar. If the customer or the client has a, a large amount of traffic or a particularly big list, we might separate those out. Next one is custom segments. Um, Corey had a great trick for custom segments that I heard on a different video. I'll let him explain that. I'm not taking any credit there. Um, but all of your different custom segments in another asset group. And then another asset group for your in-market and in-market other, which are amazingly precise and specific these days. And maybe if you've got some evidence from Google Analytics, maybe an affinity uh, category or two going in there. And then what we've seen, and we'll talk about the script later on and, and being able to chart things, is sort of where those impressions go, which is leading me up to all kinds of crazy thoughts about what we might do, but that's a sort of typical starting point. The full effectiveness of that, that's one thing I'm really keen to, to chat about maybe later on when, when we show some some data of there, there, there's a teaser. what, what, Look, what I teaser. think might be happening. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the, the other topic then i mean we've talked a little bit about campaigns we've talked about how many asset groups to start with i think it all goes back to the question of how do you run your business um let's talk about cannibalization because that is significant is a significant concern that um especially if you run a regular shopping campaign and a pmax with a shopping feed what, what's going to happen corey <laughs> Yeah, so Mike, you mentioned earlier the, the comment about control freaks, which has sort of been an internal joke, right, uh, forever in the PPC space. I think I have maybe a different view than a lot of people on this. Now, if you're a major enterprise brand that is spending millions, I get the huge concern with cannibalization across your campaigns because your messaging needs to be hyper specific for that audience. It's going to make a dramatic, the messaging is going to make a dramatic effect on quality scores in a very competitive auction space, et cetera, et cetera. But I will personally say there's going to be two, two groups here. One is how do you avoid the cannibalization with shopping campaigns and performance max? So if you truly want to avoid the cannibalization, um, generally speaking, you're going to just have two options there. You have listing group exclusions in the performance max campaign or product group, uh, product filters in the standard shopping campaign. But then you also, and I see this happen a lot, you have to remember if you're using URL expansion setting for performance max with those um, in that campaign, even if you're not targeting those products in, in the listing group side, um, you need to make sure to disable URL expansion or um, probably more preferably, just make sure to add URL exclusions for those products you don't want to show up in that Performance Max campaign. So from a standard shopping for Performance Max, um, if, if you want to control it, that's your best way of doing it. Search is a lot more tricky and goes into my main point about my opinion maybe being a little bit different than most with the cannibalization. I, 
if I am making my client um, more money, it's more profitable and Google has so much more data than it's ever going to give to me and things are doing really well, I could care less whether that search term or that product shows up in Performance Max versus my search ad. As long as the messaging is relevant, as long as we are increasing profit profits at scale, um, there's not much that I can honestly do to make sure that it shows up in Performance Max versus search other, other than just um, not using performance max our, our, our controls are a little bit more limited but personally speaking um i'm not hugely worried about it showing up in multiple campaigns as long as i am looking at things on a media efficiency ratio outside of google ads and it's adding up and it's what we are doing and testing is is working and i'm seeing those products show up and be generated and attributed for both search campaigns and performance max and we are growing i'm happy and the client's happy so that's that's kind of my two cents on it that makes sense. If your client's happy, then yeah, we're all happy, right? Mike, what's your <laughs> take on that cannibalization? Um, in the early days, I thought we were going to go back to the old days of of you know having ten thousand exact match keywords in our campaigns in order to stop cannibalization, and that is clearly a step backwards. Clearly, not what Google intend. You know, they unwound broad match or modified broad match because people weren't using it the way it was intended to be used. So clearly that wasn't the answer. So it requires a level of trust in the numbers, which I think many in the industry find difficult, mm. um, especially with the increase of modeling of conversions and Pmax being somewhat reportedly greedy in some instances. And, uh, and I know Google are never going to uh, invent a conversion and obviously not in e-com they can't but oh this conversion rhymes with this one over here we know what happened over here we don't know what happened over here yeah we're just going to say pmax caused that one um that's only going to increase the amount of modeling i think in the future with with all of the issues that we have around data so if you trust google to mark its own homework then it sounds like a great plan there's i'm i lean more that way but I've also got plenty of mates in the industry with tin foil hats firmly planted on their heads. Um, and so it's interesting to listen to their views as well. I definitely lean more towards Corey, but I'm probably not at the uh, extreme of, yes, it'll be fine. Yeah. Go. Yeah. I should add a quick disclaimer because this is really important. <laughs> my, my clients, and I'm always on a soapbox about this with every new client, is uh, if you can invest in, an, in a third party unbiased attribution tool, that is a sophisticated right. machine learning modeling based attribution tool. It's its own rabbit hole of a conversation, but mm -hmm. I can't tell you how important that is to be able as a business to get, again, an unbiased view. Every channel is going to want to take credit for that sale. And you're going to ask that question at a certain level of scale of where should we put more budget towards? You can't just trust Google. You can't just trust Facebook. Uh, they're, they're all going to try to get, take credit for that sale. So um, the sooner you can get in on the game of uh, third-party attribution tools, I think the better in most cases. So a lot of my clients and the people I work with are going to already have those tools in place. So also know that my trust for Google is that I don't really trust them that much, and I have tools to help support my trust in the, in the data. So. Yeah, and I think the crypto world is teaching us a lot about trust and, and the fact that you need third-party oversight if you don't want uh, something that looks like a bank to not be a bank and then lose all your money. Um, and then also with crypto contracts, uh, some of those are based on the code and sometimes the code is written wrong. And so a hacker is able to go in and legitimately take your money because, hey, it was the code that was doing what it was supposed to, uh, right? But the code is often wrong due to no malice on Google or Microsoft's part. It's just mistakes happen. So you want to monitor things. And that's, by the way, also where Optimizer plays. I mean, we have audits, we have automatic alerts to keep you informed when all of a sudden smart bidding goes kind of haywire because maybe it's getting a bad signal from somewhere. Um, I also have some thoughts on the cannibalization really quickly. So fundamentally, if you're going to run a shopping campaign and a Pmax campaign, you have to separate products um, at the query level, basically, right? So you can't just say, oh, I'm going to put these products in Pmax and these other products in regular shopping. If there's any potential overlap on one query kind of matching to either campaign, 
it is going to go to Pmax. So if you sell bicycles and you sell candles, great. You can put candles in one, bicycles in the other. But if you sell um, mountain bikes and road bikes, that's not going to work because some of these queries, Google is going to say, eh, it's close enough. We'll just show the one from Pmax, right? So that, that's one point on that. The other point that I've heard um, at SMX, which just happened, was use what Corey was saying, which is the URL exclusion to basically get your brand out of the equation of Pmax. And so what you do is you take your main domain, your main homepage, you make that the excluded URL, and you just advertise the subpages of that domain. Um, and that tends to, to some degree, take brand out of the equation because brand is usually most aligned with your homepage. Um, and then, of course, there's going to your rep and asking them to exclude brand keywords, which gives you back control, but you do have to ask for it. And I will say as a claim from Google, they wrote to me on this and I posted about it that they did say with both uh, dynamic search ads and exclusions and the URL rules for performance max for URL exclusions, they are synonymously buggy. Um, so just know that if you set up a URL exclusion as a rule, it might not actually accomplish the goal. Um, I've had it many times and that's why I contacted Google on this was to say, I set up these rules to not show, I don't want any clicks for performance packs going to these URLs. I set up the rules, but clearly it's still sending traffic there. And they said, oh yeah, it's 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 kind of buggy. It doesn't always work as intended. Yeah. So just make sure to use the full URL. I'm like, do you realize that some <laughs> some brands have thousands of pages and products? There's no way, like realistically, you're gonna get all the individual URLs. So just a, a, qu a quick reminder that uh, right. you can use URL rules, but they may not always work. Use yeah. scripts and tools, right? If you have thousands upon thousands to exclude, yes. that's a really good tip, Corey. Um, mm -hmm. Final question on structure before we move on. Uh, is there a benefit to running an asset group with no assets in it to force it to be a purely mm -hmm. e-com smart shopping campaign replacement? While you can. Um, I've heard from a couple of sources inside Google this week that engineers are all over this and they're working on it and it's <laughs> going to go away at some point right. fairly soon. And so to clarify, so the workaround that exists as of this recording is you can no longer do it on a new Pmax campaign, but if you create the campaign, you pause it and you unpause it, then you can go in um, and I think remove the assets or make new asset groups that have no assets. But in the new flow, uh, they already no longer allow it. Okay, so I think that's enough said on that, Corey. I'm sure you agree with that whole point. Yeah, we, we absolutely. We can. Uh, Mike, let's take a moment and look at this amazing script that you've written. So um, tell us what you did and, and why you think it's important. Well, a couple of sort of use cases to begin with. So we've got this script that will put out a couple of charts for you. Um, it'll show up in the top left the percentage of your spend that's going to shopping. So therefore, we have product ads. The red line is the percentage of spend going to YouTube. And then the gray line is everything else. And as far as I know, unless you've got some genius ideas, there is no way to pull apart this everything else bucket. So I've just called that other. So that's that DSA portion. It's the remarketing. It's the dynamic remarketing. All of that. I've looked at impressions. I've looked at click-through rates. I've looked at interactions. I can't find a way to tease that apart. And for, for people listening to the podcast, uh, so Mike is showing some stuff on screen here. So go to the show notes and we'll put that in uh, the resources so you can find this. But he's showing us a dashboard right now. And more than happy, I like everybody watching the show can get a copy of this script and go install it in their accounts and get the same output. Um, so up in the top right, then we've just got uh, a list of our Pmax campaigns in a particular account. So this is a single account script that works on one account at a time. And then we've just got the little spark lines there so you can see the actual spend over time. So the, on the left is the percentage, on the right is the actual spend over time. You can see a fair, a few spikes in the YouTube, in the red lines there. In the bottom left, we then have the percentage for each campaign. So up in the top left, that was for an, a, an individual campaign so that you can see the trends over time for an individual campaign. Bottom left, it's all of your campaigns so that you can see Really what we're looking there is sort of generally how much blue, so like roughly what's going on in this um, account for all of these campaigns, roughly how much is going to shopping. Are there any campaigns that are showing a ton of YouTube? We've sort of seen these 
spikes in different accounts since we started doing this. Um, and it was a bit of a pain before you could do this in the interface. But in order to turn on the columns for the number of views and the cost per view, you had to have a dummy YouTube campaign. You had to have had a YouTube campaign in the account at some point. Otherwise, that data was just hidden from view. It was all available via the script. But if you weren't using the script, you had to, it was a pain in the bum to set up a dummy campaign just to see that. And then you had to do the mental maths of you know, multiplying number of views, average cost per view. Okay, so that's how much I've spent on YouTube. Now, how much have I spent over here? And then to find the amount of spend on shopping. Again, you had to do a bit of mental maths, particularly if you had lots of listing groups. You pretty much had to go through there and add them all up. There's no export button on the listing group view. There's no filter on there to say, show me just the actual listing groups with spend, not all of the subdivisions, you know, all products and then all of those little bits. And then down in the bottom right here, we've just got the, the, the spend, the actual spend per campaign. But the interesting bit, so one of the use cases with this was things are going well, ROAS is there and we want to up the budgets. One of our fears was if we crank budgets too hard that the machine would just take a lot of that and go and waste it on YouTube or other where the performance maybe wasn't going to be there. So that was one of the use cases for this. I wanted to see if there was a spike in YouTube. But the other insights have come from, let me just jump forward. Oh, also asset groups. So it lists all of your asset groups with all of the data per asset group over the last 30 days. Lots of people have uh, enjoyed that view because you just can't get that table in the interface for whatever reason. But having these individual asset group charts. So what we're looking at now is we've gone inside of one campaign and there are three of these different tabs in the sheet that you'll get when you get the script. One of these charts impressions over time, one of them charts cost over the time, and then one of them charts revenue over time. And this is what happened. So that you'll see there's almost sort of three buckets. We've got the total in black across the top. We've got the blue line. So that's an asset group that's getting lots of revenue. We've got the, what is it, green, yellow, red lines in the middle, getting a decent chunk. And then there's all of the other asset groups sitting down at the bottom. But what I wanted to show you was this story of what happened when we split out. This was a campaign that had just a single asset group to start. And then we launched three new asset groups. As we were talking about earlier, that was a fairly simple, we didn't want to make too many assumptions. So we had our custom match and remarketing, we had our custom segments, and then we had our in-market. And those three asset groups, you can't even see that there are three lines. There's a red and a green and something else sitting underneath that yellow line. So the yellow line was the single asset group. And then we launched these three. And what I found fascinating with this is that the number of impressions, which is what we're looking at here, the number of impressions for the first few days, all of those new asset groups was almost identical. And we're talking tens of thousands of impressions here and almost exactly the same number. And then that incumbent, let's call it the incumbent asset group, which is the yellow line. Again, the black line is the total. That incumbent is getting almost exactly the same delta each day compared to all these new groups. So it, it sort of feels to me, that doesn't feel like machine learning. I'm not a machine learning engineer. I don't play one on the internet. You are, so I would love to get your input on this, of that just doesn't feel, that feels like a deterministic rule that some engineer has created. All right, we've got this thing. We know this performs. We've got a whole bunch of new things, new asset groups here. So let's split the traffic pretty evenly. We're sort of back to rotate evenly, that old setting. And let's give all of these new asset groups the same, but let's give that incumbent that we, that we know, that we trust, a little bit more. Then what happened next? We got this big spike in one asset group, the red line. Loads more impressions. Why? Well, if we look at one of the other tabs, the other chart, the day before, the revenue in this asset group shot up more than the other groups. And so it, it shot up impressions. It went chasing after that revenue. This is chasing the squirrel, basically. Yeah, chasing the squirrel. But... That revenue didn't last. That red line comes back down. And so the impressions come back down. But, and this was the bit that really blew my brain. Look at where that red line comes back to. It comes back to exactly where the yellow line is. That was our incumbent, you know, the, the trusted asset group. So it feels like there's almost two buckets going on here, or actually maybe three. We've got trusted asset group. We've got 
new unproven asset group. And then we've got Squirrel asset group. Let's go chase this thing because we think it's really, oh, no, it didn't work out. But because it sort of has worked a bit in the past, it's almost like it fell back into the proven bucket, mm -hmm. which gets, again, that same sort of delta, that same sort of a little bit more impressions than the asset groups that we don't yet, yet trust. And then the green one starts to take off because a bit of revenue happened there. So it starts chasing after that squirrel. And those impressions jump up. And then if we play this out over time, over the 30 days, you can sort of see everything starting to converge. The blue line shot up in the middle there because that got a bunch of revenue. So that shot up and then fell back down. And we've seen this sort of pattern over and over again in a ton of different accounts now. So I just was really curious. Um, one, are you guys seeing the same things? Um, why do you think this might be? It's meant to all be machine learning and uh, la da da, but that just does not feel like a, uh, a machine learning kind of a thing. Uh, revenue is a lot messier. Um, you can see that blue line sort of, yeah, it, maybe it's uh, above the other lines on some days, but it all sort of converges. And this goes back to the question you were asking before about which asset groups, how many asset groups. As I've seen more and more of these charts, I've started to wonder just how important the asset group and the audience signal and certainly the creative actually is. Um, if I show you this, so this is not all of the campaigns, but this is a, a, a good selection of campaigns. I haven't cherry picked this. This is just a random chunk of campaigns. So it's a second script that I will get up on GitHub as soon as possible before this comes out so that everybody has this as well. So this is a script that you can run at the MCC level and now see all of the Pmax campaigns across your whole MCC in one place. I know this is going to do some people's heads in, but essentially we're looking at the same chart, but just for everything. So the amount of blue there is the shopping. And we're averaging about 86% cost goes to shopping. And there's the odd campaign there that lights up with red. So that's spending a bunch on YouTube, but you can see the vast majority of campaigns are hardly any YouTube, if any at all. And then the gray is other. So, so if 80, go on. No, no, go ahead. You well, can... just, just to wrap it up, um, if 86% is shopping, then how important are these other assets? I'm actually setting up with our account managers a bit of a debate internally because we've got a, a few people that are really like creative so important. And there's a couple on my side. Well, I know it will be, but it doesn't seem to be yet. In the early days of Pmax, we were saying to clients, look, I know it's a pain, but please, we really need a YouTube video from you. Otherwise, the machine's going to create something that looks like my daughter's PowerPoint from 2007, and we really don't want to show that video. So we really need a video from you. But then we look at this and go, well, how important is YouTube? How important are all of those text and image assets that we're all adding to our PMAX and being forced to add to our PMAX campaigns now if 86% of the time a shopping ad is being shown? So if creative isn't that important, if impressions are being sort of randomly assigned to all of these asset groups and, and the impressions per asset group is converging to roughly the same, how important are those audience signals? It seems to me that the, the product is potentially the most important signal here. You know, the, the product image we know is important. We know the title's really important. Your price relative to your competitors, hugely important. Andreas from Creative proved that years ago. So I've got more questions than answers at this point about where we go next right. with this. But what, Disgust. So, <laughs> uh, so one important question is what is the value of putting in these assets? And it's an important question because, like you said, it takes a tremendous amount of time compared mm. to just splitting out your product feed and maybe adding different audiences to asset groups. So is that investment of time into getting the videos, the images, is that worth it? Or do you just flat out take one set of standard images and videos and put that across everything? So it sounds like that may be good enough. I think the other important question that you then raised is, is this really machine learning? Because oftentimes when we think about machine learning from Google, it's about making predictions that help us. Whereas here, it's not about predicting that there will be a squirrel. It's about seeing the squirrel and chasing it until the squirrel has gone in the tree. It's, and then again, it's waiting for squirrels to appear. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I love this whole new analogy of squirrels here. <laughs> One question I do have, though, Mike, um, once it sees a squirrel, which is kind of, so that 
squirrel is basically one audience that's all of a sudden performing better. Do you see any um, impact on that same audience in different campaigns? That's a good question. I haven't looked closely enough at that. I'm leaning towards no, but I haven't looked closely enough to know. I, right. No. So, and that, so folks, everyone's going to get this script, so uh, please download it. And we'd love to have a discussion yes. around uh, what everybody nice. else is seeing. And someone please create a site where we can all just like provide hashed data so we can get insights across thousands of accounts. That would be so awesome. Let's share. Sharing is caring. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see if Optimizer can help with that one. Um, yes, yeah, please. we can take Mike's script and we're already working on building some of the functionality he showed us. He's been very generous uh, letting us see the script and we want to make it easier for everyone to use it. Everything I learned about scripts, I learned from you. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So super interesting. Um, so again, download the script. Let us know how it goes. But uh, really interesting insights there, Mike. Uh, Corey, what about, let's talk maybe briefly about audiences. I think Mike was saying you have a great hack of some sort for doing something <laughs> audience related. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, so this is a fun subject because I think you can get a lot of insights um, for, for the business as a whole. It's kind of like uh, PPC professionals for years have been trying to preach from the mountaintops of use your search term data for more than Google ads. Like there is, this is valuable marketplace information in a lot of, in a lot of cases, if the targeting is fairly relevant and your conversion tracking is correct and all these other things. But um, when you go through and you are looking at setting up audience signals, for example, in performance max, um, the hack I think Mike's referring to is it, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you talking about like the in market other, those types of things? No, all of the buying words, your big mix and match spreadsheet. Ah, that, that one. Yeah. So I have this massive spreadsheet that takes forever to load, even in Excel, because I've just continued to build on it. So basically, what I do is there is uh, a, an ability when you're creating an audience signal for Performance Max Asset Group where you can choose custom segment and then you can put in. Um, search or keywords, basically they're display search keywords, technically speaking. And you can load that up um, in the Google Ads interface with as many keywords as, as you want. And because audience signals are just seed audiences, we know that they're going to expand um, if it can't find success with that initial seed audience, or even if it does, it may still expand from that. Um, my thought process was, well, what if I just cherry pick every commercial intent variation of, of product related or product category related search keywords. So that's what I ended up doing was just creating this massive sort of, you know, if this, then that concatenated uh, spreadsheet where it's, you know, you, you, you basically enter the product, the product category, and then it's going to pair that with a long list of variations like buy, you know, buy gold leggings or, you know, um, purchase gold leggings or, um, gold legging sales or any, anything that just shows some sort of commercial intent. And then I load that list up and, and load it in there as a seed audience for Google ads. In a lot of cases, it's it, like the system like wants to just crash on me because it's thousands. In a lot of cases, it averages like 6,000 different keywords, but they're all highly cherry picked commercial intent. Sometimes I'm taking it from past converting uh, search keywords if those products are still sold for that business. And yeah, just loading them up in there and, and saying, all right, Google, here is literally of all the searches that are out there, this is like the best of the best. Start here and then expand. Note that there's two ways to do it. Um, there's two options. There's one that says purchase intent. And then the other one is basically people who have recently searched XYZ. I like to personally load up both, either in a single audience signal or separately. Um, but yeah, I think that's a, that's a really fun approach. It's definitely an audience that I see consistently work really well, which kind of makes logical sense, right? It's really just cherry picking on people who are in the market and they're ready to buy, as opposed to leaning on Google to decide who's in market for something, which I also use. And I really love in market audiences, especially the in market other audiences. But this custom segment approach works very, very well. Can I jump in? Please. What I would what I would love to see is the difference between adding those six thousand all in one asset group and adding it to what's there versus six lots of a thousand and adding those as six new asset groups. Because based on those charts that I was just showing, it seems to me that if you add six new asset groups, a chunk of impressions get taken from the incumbents and shared evenly 
between that. So in other words, it's going to end up those six together are going to get a lot more impressions to them than just one new one. Um, in market other, we took our in market asset group, split out the top, you know, based on your insights, split out the top in market, put that in a separate asset group. And instantly that new asset group gets the same number of impressions as those other asset groups. You know, those, those lines on the chart converge really quickly. They're all getting the same impression. So it's a kind of a way to go, oh, this one, it's getting this 21.7x. It gives you that index of 21 times more likely to buy than the average bear and instantly throws more impressions at that asset group. So to, when that works really well, I wonder what would happen of lots of smaller asset groups rather than one big one. I love it. Put Corey's brain and Mike's brain together and you get this hybrid solution of overloading with custom intensity notes <laughs> and splitting it six different ways to get even more volume on it. Um, so yeah, no, this is great stuff, guys. This is uh, hopefully why people are watching to get some of these insights from you. All right. So now that we got these Pmax campaigns running with all the best practices that you've laid out there, uh, what happens in terms of auditing these things if maybe performance isn't going the way you expected? Uh, Corey, I think you have a checklist, right? Yes, I do. Let me then I'll load it up here. So as my uh, fan base will know, I am really big into like lists and I go super deep on everything. I have simplified this uh, diagnosis list. So basically, um, you know, people love checklists, as do I, especially big agencies that have a lot of work to do every day. And when you often go in your auditing account or you're trying to figure out what is going on with your performance max campaign, it can be a headache to remember all of the different places to check uh, for what might be going on. So I've created this, uh, I would say, a pretty massive list. I think it's over 40 different items that you can cover. Of course, not every business is going to need to go through every single one of these. Um, but I'll just cover the first couple of slides. And if you want the full 10 slides and all 40 some odd check, the full checklist, uh, we'll probably pro provide that as like a downloadable or something for you guys to access later. Um, so first one to go over, it's just going to be sort of the high level things that we first need to look at, right? So what is the estimated conversion reporting delay um, from the first interaction with an ad um, versus, um, so someone first interacts with the ad and then when they actually convert, we need to first have a solid understanding of how much time is going to take place between those two touch points, as well as just the overall estimated conversion reporting delay. There's going to be um, not real-time reporting. That's been at the bottom of the Google Ads interface for since it all was the green, ugly green Google Ads interface that's always been around. It's not real-time reporting. That needs to be considered before you freak out. So that's just the first thing to say. It may be that people you warmed up with the strategy change are just going through the funnel and you might need to give it some more time. So first, just make sure you're aware and you're familiar with the conversion reporting delays and any kind of average days of conversion from first ad interaction. You can look at this in an account-wide status um, in the attribution section of, your, section of your account, or you can look at a campaign specific by adding a segment to your campaign tables. Obviously, conversion tracking, I put that really high up on the list because, well, more often than not, if things tanked, um, from my experience, the first thing you should be looking at is conversion tracking as opposed to going down rabbit holes of trying to diagnose individual elements. It may just be that something broke with conversion tracking or maybe the client or yourself were messing with something in the checkout flow. And then that um, unintentionally really screwed up uh, something with the conversion tracking pixel. So make sure you check that before you go down this list. Um, also make sure you're familiar with what normal fluctuation looks like for the account. You may just have launched Pmax, and it you know it's uh, it, it, this isn't going to be applicable for you. But if you've had Performance Max for a few months, familiarize yourself with what normal fluctuation looks like for clicks, impression, uh, impressions, conversions, conversion rates. Maybe every five days isn't really going to be a good time period to look at. Look at different time periods. Get familiar with what a weekly up and down ebb and flow looks like in terms of a sort of normal fluctuation. And then go from there. Again, the whole idea, you may not have to freak out. So figure that out first and then kind of go from there. Um, after that, uh, just recent changes. This seems really obvious, but it's amazing how many people go down rabbit holes of analysis before just checking on, well, what was the last thing I did to this Performance Max campaign? Biggest things are usually going to be budget changes, bid strategy changes, um, asset group changes, listing group changes. There's other settings that may have major impacts, but these are the sort of more common ones that are going to be changing on a more regular basis.
Um, second slide is going to be any kind of uh, Google Merchant Center things, right? So disapprovals, warnings that may be affecting the products that are being that should be being served in that Performance Max campaign. Any account issues or feed issues, you'll find that in the diagnostic uh, diagnostic section of your Google Merchant Center if that's what you use. Um, any changes to the site? This goes back to conversion tracking, but it could just be uh, maybe the, another agency or your agency is doing CRO and we're testing different landing pages or we've recently updated some of the keywords on a product page for a bestseller. Those things all need to be taken into account. And unfortunately, those things aren't always communicated across staff members or even with a, a team inside of a business. So just check to see, has there been any major changes to the site? If it's a large site, check in, start on the bestsellers and see if there's any major changes there. Um, in stock products, is there any inventory changes? Again, particularly best sellers, any changes to pricing or promotions that's happened pre or post any kind of major performance fluctuations. Um, this next one gets missed a lot, but is there any extremely negative reviews? If you are a smaller, lesser known brand and you've only maybe you're selling just on Amazon and your website, go ahead and check Amazon. A lot of PPC professionals forget. I mean, a lot of consumers are going on Amazon before making their purchase decision. They might buy, they might not be buying from your site because they saw a very recent, very maybe inaccurate negative review. Don't forget that. That can really affect um, what you're going to be seeing in terms of your results for Performance Max. Obviously, if you have a lot of products, it might not change things dramatically, but definitely important to keep that in mind. And then the last one I'll share today is going to be a Google Search Console for failing URLs. Um, if you're not doing a product feed only type of uh, campaign and you, um, you are using uh, URL expansion, or even if you're not, it's important to make sure to keep tabs on Google Search Console. This gets missed quite often. Check the core website vitals section of Google Search Console to see if there's any quote unquote failing URLs. Um, this is going to affect the performance of Performance Max, in particular, the the dynamic search ads uh, portion of Performance Max. So just a few things. Uh, there's a lot more to go into. Uh, again, we'll be sharing that really soon here. But uh, but yeah. Yeah, thank you, Corey. I mean, uh, you've been very generous in sharing that very extensive checklist. It's the no freak out Pmax checklist uh, and avoid. Let's not call them rabbit holes. Let's call them squirrel holes. Squirrel holes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, great, great. Okay, so well, th this has been an amazing episode. I hope everyone's enjoyed it and uh, seen some of the ways that Corey looks at analyzing these accounts and the way that Mike looks at sort of going into uh, a fairly flat structure and getting a bit more segmented and figuring out what's going on with the machine learning. So uh, we're going to continue this discussion on Performance Max. So uh, please contribute in the comments. Let us know what you've seen. We're also putting the script URL and a link to the checklist in the show notes or you can look for those at pptownhall.com. With that, if you like this episode, make sure to check out Corey at Ads by Corey and uh, follow Mike at agencysavvy.com.au. And if you like the show, subscribe to it on YouTube. We'll be back again with another episode soon. We also have Optimizer. That's the software where I'm co-founder and CEO. We have a two-week free trial. Many of the things we've talked about today, we help make them a little bit more doable, do them more easily in less time thanks to automation and software. So check it out. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you for the